polycultures and monocultures are things that a lot of gardeners don't think about on a regular basis. But understanding the difference and then using the differences to your advantage can really make a difference in your garden. Join me today as I discuss the advantages of polycultures. Hi, I'm Gardener Scott, and I try to practice polyculture principles in all aspects of my gardening, from my landscape to my vegetable garden. And I'll show you examples of both as we proceed through this video. This bed right here is a pretty good example of a polyculture. I have roses and peonies and daylilies, there's daisies, there's California poppies, there's little pin cushion flowers. I've got some lamb's ears, some ornamental grasses. I even have some comfrey, all in this one bed. And that's the idea behind polyculture. It's all about diversity, growing different plants side by side in the same area. Monoculture is the opposite of that. It's growing all one plant in a given area. So I've got a single rose bush here just to add some color. But if this entire bed were a rose garden with nothing but rose bushes like this, then that could be called a monoculture. Mono being a single type of plant in this area. And the most common type of monoculture that most gardeners grow is a lawn. If you're familiar with the term monocrop, you probably think about big agriculture because that's the way that these big farms grow their crops. Field after field of a single plant, like corn. Drive through the American Midwest and you'll see miles upon miles of fields of corn. But a little more insidious is the great American turf grass lawn. Front lawns and back lawns cover our country, and that's monocropping. We're growing the same plant in a large area. And here's where you can look at some of the problems with monocropping. Because if you have a lot of lawn, you're probably also using a lot of chemicals to deal with the pests that are going to attack the lawn or you have a lot of fertilizers that you have to use to keep the grass growing, and herbicides to kill the weeds in the lawn. When you grow a monocrop, you tend to have more problems, and you have to revert to often expensive and possibly dangerous chemical controls. And so when you're growing a single crop, a monocrop, you're practicing monoculture gardening practices. When you start breaking things up and adding in that variety, now you start growing with a polyculture. And as you've already seen so far in this video with the gardens behind me, that's how I do it. This is my newest large garden. It's a polyculture growing lots of different plants for different reasons. Because even if we're growing a variety of plants in a given space, if we're growing them all for the same reason, we're missing out on some of the advantages of polyculture. In this bed area, I've got a whole bunch of different things going on. This is stinging nettle in this bed. I plan to use that to make a fertilizer. Over there, I've got borage. Borage is great for attracting beneficial insects, and it's also edible, just like the calendula over here. I plan to eat those flowers. This lemon bee balm can be used to make a tea, in addition to attracting beneficial insects. I like the look of the poppies, and the insects also are attracted for that reason as well. So even though the primary reason for this garden area is to attract pollinators, I have edible plants growing within it. And it's right next to my raspberries, one of my edible crops. You can intersperse the edible plants and the visual appealing plants to get the insects in and to also give you some potential harvests. 
and the ideas transfer over into the vegetable garden. This moth that's flying around will lay eggs and those caterpillars would potentially eat some of my plants. But when I intersperse the plants within individual beds and grow a variety, I tend to start confusing those insects that find the garden. I've got carrots and beans and kohlrabi and okra and potatoes. So when a moth is flying around looking for something to eat, it's more likely to land on something that it doesn't want to lay eggs on than the plant that it's looking for. And so while in the other areas of my garden I want to attract the beneficial insects like pollinators and predatory bugs, in my vegetable garden I want to try to deter some of those insect pests. And a polyculture process can really help make that happen. It confuses the bugs that could become a pest. And while I look at the kohlrabi, I can see some holes chewed in the leaves, but there really aren't any holes chewed in the leaves of the beans or the okra or the potatoes. And so something did attack these plants, but they left the other plants alone because that's the way a lot of insect pests work. They'll target specific types of plants. And so when you mix them up, well, you might have one plant that's affected, but you'll have many more that aren't. The most common polyculture method of gardening within a vegetable garden is one that you've probably heard of. It's square foot gardening. The idea being that we take a bed and break it into individual square foot parcels and then decide what to grow in each of those parcels. So we could be growing different plants side by side, like I do in this bed, where I've devoted four square feet for my potatoes and another four square feet for my beans. The beauty of square foot gardening is that you can break it up. It's built into the method. And that leads us into one of the great advantages of polyculture gardening. If I grow all the same plant in one bed, then that plant is absorbing particular nutrients that that plant needs more than others. But when we're growing a variety of plants, we're not depleting the soil. In fact, in many cases, by choosing a specific variety of plants, we can add nutrients to the soil at the end of the season when we amend with all this organic matter that we have. Another common polyculture practice that you may have heard of is three sisters gardening. Like in this bed right here where I've got corn and I've got beans crawling up the corn and then I've got squash that will grow to cover the ground as a living mulch. In a polyculture, when you choose the plants that are growing together, you can take advantage of some of the attributes of those individual plants. So now the corn acts as a trellis to these bean plants, and the squash helps cut down on some of the weeds that would steal nutrients from the beans and the corn. And at the end of the season, when I work the bean plants back into the ground, I'm introducing some of the nitrogen that those plants have been using during the growing season. Now, there are no specific rules to polyculture, particularly in a vegetable garden. You can mix and match and do whatever you want to do. Like in this bed right here, where I've got my favorite high tomato trellis. Well, having a single tomato plant really doesn't make much sense. So I actually have eight plants growing up into this trellis. It's strong enough to support those plants and I can come to one spot to harvest a bunch of tomatoes. But I am growing eight different varieties of tomatoes so that if there is a particular disease or pest that discovers this bed, I'm probably not going to lose all of the plants, maybe just one or two, because some of these varieties are resistant to some of those diseases. And at the end of the bed, I'm growing basil. Basil can be a deterrent for many of those insect pests that might be attacking my tomato plants. So even by having basil on this end and basil on the other end, I am practicing some modified polyculture methods within this bed. And also on the other side, 
I've got some pepper plants growing on the end as well. So this is primarily a tomato bed, but I've got two different types of basil, two different types of pepper, and eight different types of tomatoes all within this same bed. The closest I come to monoculture gardening is this potato patch where I have eight grow bags with four different types of potatoes. Yes, it's all the same plant growing in the same space and I'm really not growing anything else around it. But because I am growing the different varieties, I'm lessening some of the potential problems just like in my tomato bed. You don't have to do all polyculture. You don't have to do all monoculture. But the advantages of the polyculture in the other beds lead me to that being my primary method of gardening. This is another one of my polyculture beds. I've got zucchini, strawberries, chamomile, there are cucumbers here, and a number of herbs growing around the edges. And at the end of the bed are sunflowers. And so the sunflowers and the chamomile are attracting pollinators that can help out with the squash, the zucchini, and the cucumbers. Lots of different plants growing in the same space, but they're working together to help themselves. Now, I do like some order in my garden, and I like being able to choose specific plants that work well together. You can go a little more chaotic, a little more freestyle, and just take some of the seeds that you want to grow and broadcast them across a bed. And then as those plants begin growing, you'll thin out the ones that are too close together or maybe that you identify as ones you don't want. And then you accept what you have. I think that is a little more work because you do have to choose the plants after the fact, whereas I think it's a little easier to choose the plants before the fact, but that's what I did in portions of this bed behind me. I just broadcast some perennial and annual seeds to see what I would get. And the different types of poppy are beautiful. I didn't grow those from seed and put them in specific places. They just sprouted from the seeds I threw out onto the ground in the fall. And the same with a lot of these other flowers. So you can intersperse your planning and the variety of just letting plants grow where they fall and really have some fun with this in your landscape. Especially in the vegetable garden, growing a lot of these plants closer together than you might otherwise grow in rows in an open bed really cuts down on the amount of weeds. They're helping each other out by shading the soil and preventing those weed seeds from germinating and growing. I love that as a benefit to a polyculture. And if you really want to expand your gardening culture, consider adding livestock to the mix as well. When you have animals that you're raising within your garden, that just increases the aspects of polyculture even more. This is something that if you're not doing, I think you should think about. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening. Mm -hmm.